is turned. Oh, I have the wrong mic. Somebody else grabbed the wrong mic. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everybody. All right, we'll try that again. Hey, I just wanted to get up here and uh, announce ahead of time that we have the Happy Church on the front lines this morning. They're going to help lead us in worship. Um, after everybody else is in the room, you know, all the late people, um, I'll introduce them personally to you, all right? But uh, thanks for the Happy Church coming up this morning and leading us in worship. So why don't you all stand and we'll worship an amazing God in song, okay? everybody. Um, if you are new with us this morning here at Centerville Grace, just want to give you a special welcome, and we would love to get to know you, know who you are. And what we do as a church is if we can get some contact information from you, we'll send you one email, and that one email will tell you all the different ways that you can get connected here at Centerville Grace. We don't send you 100 emails. We don't send you, we don't call you a million times. We don't sell your information. Yeah, we don't sell you insurance or anything like <laughs> no, that. Oh, gosh, no. Um, so one email. So the best way for you to get connected with us is to fill out a connection card. They're in the seat pockets in front of you. If you fill one of those out and put it in the offering boxes out in the lobby, that's one way. You can go to Centerville Grace org slash cc for connection card fill one out also if you want put some prayer requests on there we yeah. love praying for our church family so that's what they're there for and um, yeah appreciate it if you do that mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Oh, we have the Happy Church here today. And yeah. just a little background, the Happy Church is our sister church down in Jackson, Kentucky. And uh, it's right in the center of kind of the most impoverished area of our country. And so they minister to a very impoverished culture. And so we resource them a lot. We partner with them on a lot of things. And one of the things we do is we help them provide Thanksgiving dinners for the families associated with their church. And this year they're shooting for 80 families to provide a Thanksgiving dinner for. So we, our part is to uh, supply the finances to do that. So we're guessing about $40, um, but that's what we had last year. And I just heard on the news that Thanksgiving is going to be 27% more expensive this year. You all are feeling that. But uh, anyway, $40 for a Thanksgiving meal. We're shooting for 80 and uh, I haven't counted to see how many we've got yet, but... Uh, that's kind of where we are as a yeah. church, help them do that. So they can go out and buy 80 turkeys and 80 mashed potatoes and 80 stuffings mm -hmm. and 80 of everything. And so a family down there can have a Thanksgiving dinner that they otherwise wouldn't have had. So uh, if you all want to contribute to mm -hmm. that, just mark your donation as Happy Church Thanksgiving and we'll get it in the right place. And then we had a couple announcements regarding our ladies, and Krista <laughs> is never excited about ladies' Hi. things, so I asked her if she could come up here and fake it. <laughs> okay, number one, we have the best ladies in the world who go to this church, and I love y'all so much, and so I just want us to get together and to hang out, and so every time that we get to do that, I just get really excited. Okay, so things that are coming up for our women here at church. Uh, so we are going to go to lunch next Sunday at Old Scratch Pizza. Um, it's kind of by Big Lots, and I don't know road names, but I do know like where all the stores are. So if you need more descriptors, let me know. Or if you have any questions, let me know. You don't need to sign up. It's just going to be after second service. So come to uh, second service or come to first service. Go get some coffee and then come to second service. And then after that, we'll all just meet over um, at Old Scratch Pizza. It's got a ton of space. So we've done this before, and we had a great turnout last time. I think we had like 25 ladies show up there and there was plenty of room. So if you are new, if this is your first Sunday, we want you to come and hang out with us um, next Sunday after church. And if this is your 1,010th Sunday, we want you to come and we want to hang out with you next Sunday after church as well. So all are welcome. All are invited. All are encouraged to come. We just want to get to know you better and just spend some time with some of the amazing women who are here at church. Next thing that we have coming up is our annual Favorite Things Christmas Party, huh? and it's so fun. So there's so many parts to it, and I'm going to just try to like calm it down and then tell you each piece in an organized fashion. So um, number one, uh, we have breakfast that is provided, or a brunch really, and um, we could always take you know donations for that. So if you would like to volunteer to make something, talk to Kathy Denlinger. We make a huge just spread out in the lobby um, for everybody to have an amazing meal. Then we have tables that are set up throughout this room, and different women volunteer to decorate these tables, and goodness, they do such a great job, and I think Kathy's your point person for that as well, so let us know if you wanted to uh, sign up to decorate a table. It, you come in, and it's just, you're like, this is what Christmas looks like, and it's just so fun, um, and this is a really great event, too, to invite neighbors or friends or family, people who don't come here. We want to bring them in and show them this really just special time of just slowing down in the midst of the busyness of the Christmas season. Um, then we're, we'll have some um, music, um, and we'll spend some time in worship. And this year, we have a really great speaker. And I don't know if you guys know her yet, and if you don't, you really, really need to. Her name is Sherry Montgomery. She's one of my favorite people. Um, every time, that's right, Jody. that's right. Um, every time that I talk to Sherry, she lovingly moves me towards Jesus with every single conversation that I have with her. I have such respect and such a special place for her in my heart, and I'm really excited for you guys to get to hear from Sherry. She talked at our women's retreat, and I know that the room was moved um, closer to Jesus, and so I'm really excited for the work that God is going to do through her um, for this event. And then after Sher Sherry talks, then we do our favorite things gift exchange. So this part might be something that you've never heard of, but don't worry, I'm going to explain it to you. So think of one item that you love that's like $5 or $5 or less. Beth Holmes would pick zebra cakes, right? She loves zebra cakes, so she might get a box or two of zebra cakes, and you're going to buy three of that same item. And all the women at your table are going to do the same thing. 
You can wrap them if you want. You don't have to. And then through a series of mathematical algorithms that you do not have to figure out, um, we'll have you trade gifts with the women at your table. And so then you leave with three favorite things from different women at your table. Um, so it's just a really nice event to get together with friends, to get some extra little goodies for yourself, and just to slow down. So it's on Saturday, December 10th, and it's from 10 to noon. Um, and it's free to come just sign up online by December 8th. And it's just always such a really good time. So be praying for that event. Save that date on your calendar. Invite your friends. Invite your family. Everybody is welcome women. Women. Everybody is welcome. Men, I know that it sounds really great for you, but you're going to do something else, actually, that Ned is going to talk to you about right now. Right now? Right now. Go ahead, Ned. You're saying you're done? Um, for this moment, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, we have something coming up called foaling. Uh, it's not fouling. It's foaling. It's because it's football and bowling. So yeah. instead of using a bowling ball, you use a football and you throw it at the pins, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're going to the foaling warehouse, and that's a couple of Saturdays from now, just two weeks away. So mm -hmm. you can sign up again online for that. We need to know you're coming to make reservations. Uh, centervillegrace.org slash sign up for that. And then just also a reminder that uh, your um, Operation Christmas Child boxes are due uh, next Sunday. Mm -hmm. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Yeah, so get them here yep. next Sunday, and then mm -hmm. we take them to the drop-off point and get that done. So hopefully you're all familiar with that. I'm going to talk to yeah. Mike. We've got some guests here. Yeah, so we have some guests here, and I was going to interview uh, Pastor Mike here, but uh, I want to introduce you to the head cheese at the Happy Church. She's sitting right down here. It's Connie Tabor. And sitting on her lap is Jackson. I didn't introduce him for service, and he was ticked at me. He's holding up a happy church thing that he helped draw. Okay. So that's Connie. That's her grandson, Jackson. We got John and Chris here who retired from the happy church. Thanks for all the years of service you put in. But this is Pastor Mike. I don't know if all of you have met him before. So you've been down there, what, 20 years? Yeah, 22, and then started a happy church 20 point something years ago. 20 so. point something. Yes. So kind of give you a little recent history down there. Uh -huh. So COVID hit. Yep. And then as we're coming out of COVID, uh, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, the spring rains hit and you had a 100-year flood. Yep. And then on July 28th of this year, you had a thousand year flood. Yes. And you hadn't had any floods really before that. No. So this is kind of a new thing. Yes. And so, how has the flood impacted ministry down there? You, you, so, yeah, let me introduce, okay? So, kind of yeah. get the story. This is Mike's daughter, Tiffany. She leads worship down at the Happy Church. She does an awesome job. Yay! Big round of applause. And over here hiding in the dark is Taylor. Taylor is a sophomore in high school, and she started at Happy Church in fourth grade. So she is, she is very typical of the Happy Church's ministry target. Reach the young kids, change the next generation, and Taylor is uh, doing an awesome job. So anyway, how did, how did this whole flood thing change your ministry? Well, the impact? It, obviously it put the brakes on it, it was kind of a weird couple years anyhow, and, but we were recovering, excited, and then boom, you get hit by this thing, July 28th. You're actually the first one to come down. We had a group of Centerville people there when the flood hit to do the shoe giveaway that was going to be on Saturday. And uh, they were up high on the hill and all happy. Um, they didn't have food. So, by the way, uh, Captain Ned here took a jet down there and took food and supplies. If you hadn't heard that story, you'll have to ask him about it. It was a response to an email. But he's the first one that came down um, to help start mucking and to try to get electric into our home. We had four families living on campus, all of us immediately homeless, uh, or without that home anyhow. And uh, so anyhow, it's been an amazing, amazing time. We're recovering. It's been slow. We've had 70 groups down, 31 deliveries. Um, now, some groups have come more than once. We're, we're, I just have a spreadsheet, and I'm not looking for the repeat visits, but that's where we're at right now, and uh, we still got a lot to do. We're in the skilled mode, but we're having kids' night out at Oakdale, which is a international and international boarding school in Breathitt County, They're ho and we use them anyhow in the past because we love taking teenagers and have them help them with the kids for kids' night, stuff like that, finding where their strengths are in leadership or whatever and put them to work. So they're not sitting on their blessed assurance singing, we shall not be moved. So, 
You can okay. smack my hand later. I'll let you. Okay. So anyhow, yeah. uh, we thought uh, we were wondering in that first three days, we had no communication with anyone. We thought, okay, maybe the ministry's over. Maybe it's time to move on to go somewhere else, do something else. You know, God, what are you telling us, right? Um, because like I said, no cell phone service, no way to con contact anyone. We're trapped. We're flooded in, uh, living in the upstairs of the church. Um, five of us were up there for a couple of days. So, um, but when the power came back on and stuff restored, our, our phones just literally just blew up and didn't stop dinging With for need. many minutes checking on us, but also, Hey, we're coming down. What do you need? You know, we're going to be there. So it's like, okay, God, we're, we're still in this and we're going to stay here and we, we know what we want to do and he still wants us to do it. So. Yeah. So just so you know, the happy church isn't just a church building. It's a campus and they have ministry buildings and all their staff live there and, and staff houses on, on the campus. And mm -hmm. so they got like 10 structures that they're recovering from flood. So they got ripped down to the studs and the floor joists and everything's being replaced. So it's a, it's a big expense. So still raising money for that. And uh, obviously the Thanksgiving meals. And by the way, if you're here today, who's speaking at the Happy Church? Well, somebody they may or may not know by the name of Alan Kiefer. All right. So, so if you want to check yeah. out Alan at the Happy Church this morning, you go on their Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash the Happy Church. And uh, you can watch their service down there today as well. Don't slash the Happy Church. <laughs> Front slash the Happy Church. Okay. No. And they mentioned groups going down. Bad yeah. humor. I'm sorry. It just comes out. There have been a ton of groups going down there. Plus, you mentioned 31 deliveries. This is yeah. fans, it's food, it's yeah. air conditioners, yeah. it's generators. And I know I was there one day, and other churches were coming to the Happy Church to pick up supplies to go out to the remote areas and take them to people that needed them. So yeah. it's like the Happy Church became the hub of the county in helping yeah. all these flooded out victims. Um, yeah. So it was awesome to see the reputation and the ministry that you guys have down there. Well, it, honestly, it's just God doing stuff through other people and using us as the connector. So I don't understand how it happened. Uh, I love what we're doing in with the community. And also, um, there's a lot of people still living in tents and campers and, and in their mold-filled homes, even with children. So we're, we were also trying to raise money and other people to get these um, empty shell 40... 16 by 40 homes, mm -hmm. right? And um, with the metal roof already on and the siding already on. Uh, so we've ordered three of those. They're going to be delivered in a couple weeks to people who uh, don't have a place to live. And so we're hoping to get those insulated and drywalled. We'll need help with that stuff too, as well cool. as doing the other stuff. So awesome. we'll do what we can. All right. Well, thanks for coming up today. Thank you for and, having uh, us. It's awesome People don't let us out of Kentucky much. Huh? <laughs> it's awesome to have you guys as ministry partners and just as a great friend. Mike's one of my best friends. Yep. And uh, I call yeah. you my mentor. Oh, that's scary. Yes. <laughs> nope. Nobody's called you to ask for mentoring help, have they? No. Okay. No, because they know you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Mike and Taylor and Tiffany, and let's stand together and worship again our awesome God. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. Oh, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because He's never
Father God, I pray that that is the cry of our heart this morning. That it's being with you in your presence, experiencing and worshiping your glory is our heart's desire this morning. We know that nothing else can satisfy. We know that nothing else can fulfill our longing than just you. And I pray as the psalmist prayed, I pray that we would seek you and seek your presence and dwell in your house. Because everything else comes second. Thank you, and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Can you give it up for our happy church guests? Fantastic. All right. Well, welcome. My name is Dave. We're so glad to have you. And if you are new, we're actually in part two of our new series called Filling in the Blanks. How you live the story makes all the difference. And last week, we talked about how your life is actually like a story where we get to fill in certain blanks, right? Uh, We don't get to fill in all the blanks, but the ones that we do, like we played the game Mad Libs last week, all the ones that we do get to fill in make a huge difference in the direction and the quality and the tone of our lives. But your life is a story, whether you recognize it or not, it really is a story. And the question that we really wrestled with last week is, what story do I want to tell? What story, when it comes to dating right now, some of you are in the dating mode right now, what story do I want to tell later to my future spouse? Uh, What story do I want to tell my kids? What story do I want to tell my grandkids about the choices that I've made? And so each blank that we get to fill in, every decision that we get to fill in, will become a permanent part of our story. And so last week, we really encourage you to think about this question, what story do I want to tell in really every arena, every area of our lives? And because our lives are a story, we oftentimes think in terms of story, not just about our own lives, but in the lives of other people. Uh, in fact, when we try to get to know people, we ask them story or questions about the story of their lives. We ask them things like origin stories. Where did you come from? Where did you grow up? You know, we want to know that. Some of us just go flat out, very blunt. This is what I do at times. I just ask the question, what's your, what's your story? I want to hear it. And sometimes people go, well, what, what do you mean? Just whatever your story you want to tell, tell me your story. I just love a good story. And so people tell, our, this, tell stories about their lives. But at the end of the day, it's true, that I think, that no matter who you are, we, we want stories to make sense, right? We want people's stories to make sense. We want our stories to make sense, but especially other people when we're trying to find out what do you do, where are you from, where you live, we, wanna, we want these stories to make sense, uh, all stories. This is why for some of us, it's so hard to leave the movie theater to go to the bathroom, right? You know, for some of us, we, we've been in that spot. It's like, do I get up? Because if I get up, I know I'm going to miss something, and then I got to come back. And when people come back from the bathroom in a movie, what's the question they ask the person next to them? What did I miss, right? What did I miss? Because when I left, they were so in love, and now she's not even willing to call that guy. Or before, he was in like so danger, like such grave danger, and he was about to die. Now he's sipping a cocktail on the beach. Like, what, what happened? What did I miss? And when it comes to movies, it's nice. We can rewind the tape if we're at home or ask somebody the question, but... But in all stories, in your story, in my story, we want stories to make sense. It's our natural inclination to want to fill in the blank, fill in the gap of people's stories. It's our natural inclination, right? And uh, that's the idea that I want to talk to you about this morning is kind of how we do that, how we fill in the, in the blanks in, in people's, other people's stories. The last week we talked about filling the blank of our stories, but this morning I want us to think about this this decision that we have to make, continually have to make, about filling in the blanks of other people's stories. Because this morning, I want you guys to be aware of something that you may or may not be aware of, that that we do this so 
often we actually get into the habit that becomes second nature in filling in other people's stories. And again, how we choose to fill these, these blanks in, these gaps in people's stories, will make incredible difference on the impact of our relationships with these people on every level, whether this is a person that you met for the first time or if you've married this person and you've been married for them for 50 years, this has tremendous impact on our relationships. And so I want to talk about uh, what we do that is really very instinctively done at the beginning of most relationships when we want relationships to work out. Right? We, we, we're gonna, we do this thing initially. It's, it's kind of a, a second nature kind of thing. We do this up front, but then eventually we kind of change gears and kind of get into, a, a, I would say, a bad habit that we're going to talk about. But it's this natural inclination that I think we start off with wisely, and yet somehow we end up on the wrong path. And so I want to get this morning, I want to look at a very, very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Chances are you have probably heard this before, maybe at a wedding, maybe at your own wedding, uh, maybe this was part of your vows, but this is called the love chapter, the love chapter. And the love chapter was written by the Apostle Paul. He was writing to the Corinthians, and he was writing to them about love. He was defining love, and he was telling them love is not so much a noun, but a verb. Here's what love does, and here's what love does not do. And so in this very familiar passage, he describes what love does. In verses 4 through 6 that we're going to look at, uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, yep, I get it. I get it, Paul. I understand why you would put that, uh, why you put that. But when you get to verse 7, verse 7, at least to me and maybe, maybe for some of you, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you start thinking about it as far as the implications to it. Because what Paul does is he takes these four statements and he puts them together and what we want to do is kind of take each statement and kind of look at them separately. But I think if we do that, we're going to miss Paul's point. I think Paul's trying to make one big important principle point in verse 7 that it's going to impact all of our relationships. And if we take one of those out, it seems like Paul is actually giving maybe some bad advice or unwise counsel. Or uh, maybe if we did this, this would actually be worse for our relationships, not better. And so I want to look at verse 7. Uh, this morning specifically. But before we get to all that, I just want to do a disclaimer again like I did last week. Uh, this whole sermon series is based off of really a, a conglomeration of sermons that I've heard over the years that have impacted my life, and I've kind of put them and packaged them together as far as this series. So I want to give credit where credit is due. And so like last week, I want to point you to the, the sermon that really has influenced this sermon. It was the series called Staying in Love by Andy Stanley, which was written years and years ago. It's actually a marriage series, but I think the principle that he's going to give applies to all relationships. Uh, but this was, this was what um, kind of inspired this talk. So here's how... Paul writes the love chapter. Here's how he begins in verse 4. He says this, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. And again, if you were the first century reader in Paul's world reading this, you'd probably be going, yep, I get that. Yeah, love is not patient. Yeah, or love is patient. Love is kind. I got all that. That all makes sense. He goes on. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no records of wrongs. Yep, Paul, we got that. Great reminder. Yep, keeps no records of wrongs. Sometimes I forget to forget kind of thing, but thanks for the reminder, Paul. Got all that. And then he says this, the love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And this goes maybe a little bit deeper of a thought, but again, yeah, I understand. Love does not delight in evil. Love doesn't want harm done to evil, but rejoices with the truth and reality. We, we got that, Paul. And so those are all we get. And then Paul uh, does something. He, he shifts to verse 7, and again, he begins to use these really extreme or absolute terms, which for us in the, in the 21st century world, we don't like absolutes or extreme language. But he uses the word always four different times. It says that love always does this, love always does this, love always does that, love always does that. And again, it's so easy to want to just take one of those out and just look at it by itself and go, well, I'm not sure that I should be able to should do this every single time. And, and the idea is Paul is trying to say something, one big principle, and that's why he's using the same word always, 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 and, you know, and just really quick succession, just boom, 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 boom. It's really trying to make one, I think, big 
point than four different points. But here's what he says next. He says, it, being love, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And if, and if you were like me reading this going, I, you know, on the surface that sounds nice, but I don't know if we would always, like, especially the idea of trust, I don't know if I should always believe everything always kind of thing. Like, what do you mean? And this is why I wanted to use Andy Stanley's stuff because I thought this was so clarifying for me as far as what this does and does not mean. But this idea of always trust is, is hard to put our arms around, right? Like always trust. Because if someone always trusts, what do you call them? Gullible, right? That person's gullible. And by the way, did you guys know that the word gullible is actually a made-up word? It's not even found in the dictionary? Did you guys know that? No, don't fall for that. That's true. It's not true. It's in the dictionary. It's actually a word, okay? If you, if you, sorry if you trust me on that one. But um, always trust, always trust. But right, but that's the thing. It's like, should we always trust? You know, so uh, how do we understand this? Again, I think it's one big principle. And to explain what Paul is going to, we're going to explain Paul's thing here and then go back to this verse. But let me try to explain the best that I can that, that, uh, that made sense to me. So in every relationship, whether you're married or you know, not married, in, in friendship, you know, work relationship, in every relationship, there's going to be a, an opportunity to fill in the blank. Because there's always going to be this, this tension between, at times, between your expectations and somebody else's behavior. There's going to be a gap or a space or a blank to fill in. Meaning this, that I expected you to do this, but you ended up doing that. I expected you to be here at 12, and now it's 12.45, and you're still not here. I expected you to like, respond to an email three days ago that I sent it to you like, three days ago, and I still haven't gotten that email back. Or I texted you a couple of days ago, and, and I still haven't. Like, there's a gap between your expectations and their behavior. And whenever there's a gap, whenever there's a space to fill in, we ask the question because we want to fill in the story somehow. We ask the question, well, why? Why? And we want to know, like we want to fill it in. And before sometimes we get a chance to talk to the person, we end up filling in the blank ourselves. And we have really two main ways that we do this. We can either fill in this blank with believing the best about the person to explain their behavior, or we can assume the worst. We can believe the best, or we can assume the worst. We can either be generous in our explanation of why they didn't do what we expected them to do, or we can simply go negative. And I'm telling you, we have this opportunity every single time this tension happens in any kind of relationship. And again, the choice that we make and filling in that gap, we're, you know, it's, it's huge. And we're not talking at this point, we're not talking about what you say to them or what you do with them. I'm just saying in our, in our minds is where it starts. We can either believe the best and fill it in that way in the narrative, or we can assume the worst. We can either believe the best, and you know what, she, you know, she's late, but you know what, I bet she's late because traffic. I bet she's late because something came up. I bet she's late because, you know, she's, you know, something happened that she, you know, she would have been here if she could have. Or she's late. You know what? She's late all the time. Like she is so independable or undependable. She just so like, you know, just, yeah, like I just can't stand her. Like, you know, we just fill in the blank with something somehow, and we can either go positive or we can go a negative. We can believe the best or we can assume the worst. And again, how we fill it in affects our attitude towards that person. And when it affects our attitude, eventually it affects our posture and our tone, and it affects our behavior towards them. For example, uh, husbands. Uh, I'm going to rat the husbands out here. Uh, and none of, none of our husbands do this. I don't know, I don't know about that. But, but I've been around husbands long enough where they're, when they're trying to call their wife on the phone around other husbands and the wife does not answer, like, the husband just goes, you know what, she never answers her phone. Like, she never does that kind of thing. Anybody, anybody ever? No one's willing to raise their hand on that one, but that's okay. I have been there, and I have done this, and I'll, I'll confess. I have done this. I have gone negative. I try to call Beth, and Beth's not picking up. Like, where's Beth? 
where's her phone? And I can go negative. I can think, oh, I bet she left her phone up in the bedroom again. And she's probably, and she, you know, she doesn't, she's so irresponsible and she doesn't care. You know, she knows I'm at the grocery store and she knows I'm shopping and I call her during the grocery store. And I can just simply go negative, right? But when I do finally call her, right? And when I do finally call her, what do you think my tone and attitude of her, you know, to, towards her is, right? When, when she finally calls me back, what do you think I'm going to answer with? Where have you been? Like, where have you been? I've been trying to call, da 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 and, and I can just be so negative. But then she tells me, well, you know where I've been? Our son threw up in the van and the vacuum, I had to vacuum it all out. And so I couldn't hear the phone vacuuming. And I'm like, oh, I thought you were being uncaring and irresponsible. And here you are being so responsible and so caring. And, and, and I just look like an idiot now, right? Because I assumed the worst instead of believing the best. I, I can do this, and we can all do this. And the point is that every relationship, we have an opportunity, a choice. Do we believe the best, or do we assume the worst? And I know why we do what we do. Oftentimes, it's based on two factors, present circumstances and past experiences. I understand this. Like, why am I doing, why am I choosing to go this way in the narrative? Because, well, you know, she's not answering the phone, or he's late, or he didn't email me back, or he didn't text, you know, kind of thing. That's the reality. That's the present circumstances. But even more than that, it's past experiences. Because of what I can tell you how many times they've been late before, or I can tell you how many times they dropped before, or you know, how they, you know, they've forgotten. And, and we do this out of a self, self-protective mode. We, we, you know, we don't want to be hurt again. We don't want to whatever. And so we we assume the worst oftentimes based on past experiences. And I think that's natural. But as we're going to see, that's not always that helpful in the relationship, the relationships that you care about the most specifically. So the question is for you guys, where do you go in your mind? When there's that gap, when there's that space, when there's that blank to fill in, do you, do you tend to believe the best or do you assume the worst? But regardless of your present circumstances, Regardless of your past experiences, what we have found is people who have the happiest, healthiest, most successful relationships tend to or often believe the best. They have a habit of believing the best, giving the most generous explanation possible. Now, uh, to kind of prove that or to defend that, that idea, there's a book out uh, that is a pretty old book now. It's called The One Thing You Need to Know. Uh, it's actually a leadership book. So if you're reading this as a relationship book, don't. It's actually a leadership book. And the premise of this leadership book is that in every area of life, the idea is like there's like one main thing that you need to get right to be successful in that one arena of life. And so for examples in the book, they use marriage as an example. And what they did was they, they, they shared a study that researchers did to kind of figure out what's the one thing you need to know about marriage and what's the one thing you need to get right about marriage? And so what they did was they took you know, hundreds of people and who were in happy, healthy, successful relationships who have been married for at least 10 years or more, and they, they basically asked all kinds of questions to these people. And they asked questions looking for a common denominator with all these married couples who were so happy and healthy and successful. And they were looking to see what the common denominator was, and they thought it would be the idea of understanding each other would be the one main thing. Because when they did other research about with unhappy couples, they found out the one common, common denominator between all unhappy couples was that there was like this disconnect, this misunderstanding, these expectations that, that they, they weren't fulfilling, and, and they just was like they just kept missing each other that way. And so they thought... Well, when we do our study on healthy couples and happy couples, then, then it's going to be understanding. And what they discovered was they were surprised. It was not, in a sense, understanding that was the one main thing. What they discovered was that actually these couples actually had a very unrealistic view of each other, but in a very positive way. For example, husbands, when they, when they asked their husbands to kind of rate themselves in all kinds of areas of life, they would put certain numbers down. But when they asked the spouse the same questions about that husband, all those numbers were higher than what the husband put down for himself and vice versa. In other words, there was a kind of a more realistic expectation from the person writing, but the spouse had, a, had an unrealistic expectation, a higher view in a sense of their spouse than what the spouse had of themselves. And so here's what they write uh, as far as in this book. Here's a little quote. 
And this is written in kind of first person, like if you're the husband or the spouse. And so over time, my positive, and notice they use this word illusions, like these weren't, this is not really reality in a sense, but this is how I viewed my positive illusions to create an upward spiral of love. My illusions give me conviction, and my conviction leads to security, and my security fosters intimacy. And my intimacy, in a sense, then reinforces love. Putting these together, he says, putting these conclusions together, this controlling insight can serve as the one thing you need to know about a happy marriage. And here's what they found out in the research. And, and if you're you know, taking notes, this is the one thing that you need to take away from this message. Find the most generous explanation for each other's behavior and believe that. Find the most generous explanation for each other's behavior and believe that. In other words... Happy, happiest couples, healthiest couples end up doing what, again, what we do instinctively when we start dating each other. What do we do when we start dating? We, we, we just kind of give the most generous explanation possible. We just go, okay, well, they're late. Oh, I bet, you know, I bet she's doing her hair because she wants to look good for me, right? I, I, I get that. I understand. Like, we give the best generous, you know, kind of thing. And so what you need to understand is when it comes to relationships, and I think any relationship, is this idea of a relationship spiral is what they kind of pointed to in this quote. That when I begin to believe the best about a person, right, and vice versa, we begin to spiral upward. That creates this the security and intimacy and further love. But when I start assuming the worst about somebody, we begin to spiral downward. We begin to just go around and around, and it gets more unhealthy as it goes down. Right? The same true when it comes to hiring and employees. Like when we hire somebody that we're hoping to get, you know, they would work out, we kind of overlook some flaws and overlook some past things if we really want them to be working for us. But over time, you know, we can start, you know, gravitating more towards, you know, we're going we're gonna to assume the worst over time about this person. This person's no good. This person's lazy, whatever. And, you know, downward it can go. And so what happens over time that we can get into these habits, these habits, and if we're not careful we can spiral, I think, downward more than we realize, right? And we can, we can assume the worst, and this is where I tend to go. I'm just, just, just being honest. I can tend to go this way because I love to be right, right? right? I love to be right, and I want you to know how much I know that I'm right, right? And I just, I just want people to know I'm right. And it's so easy to go, well, you know, Late again, like I knew it, you know, I knew it. you're going to be late again, right? I, you know, I, told, I was telling people that I actually want to bet you were going to be late again today because I just assumed that you're going to be late because you're always late. That's my narrative. You're always late. And I could be right. And every time you choose to go negative, here's the thing. You, you may be right. You may be right. But you're choosing, you're choosing to undermine the relationship. Every single time you assume the worst, you are choosing to undermine the relationship that you're claiming, hopefully, that is important to you. Because here's how this communicates. This is what it communicates to the person that you're assuming the worst about. You're communicating distrust and disappointment. Every single time. Distrust and disappointment. If you consistently fill in with assuming the worst, if you're, you consistently do a negative thing, it communicates, I don't trust you and you disappointed me again and again and again. And I don't, I don't care if you're a people pleaser or not, nobody wants to feel like they're disappointing somebody else. And so we can communicate this idea of disappointment, disappointment, disappointment. But if you choose to be generous in your explanation, you're choosing not, not the idea of distrust or disappointment, but you're choosing to say, I trust you. I trust you. And when you communicate that I trust you, it creates margin in the relationship. And that margin is an invitation for them to move towards you in the relationship. It moves to your direction. I choose to trust you. And when you say I choose to trust you, it's saying I trust you. That means I accept you. And our hearts are like acceptance magnets. We just gravitate towards acceptance. And so you are opening the door, you're creating margin for them to move in your direction. When you say, you know what, I don't know the story yet, but I'm, I'm, ass I'm not assuming the worst, I'm going to believe the best. And here's how this sounds in real life. They call you up, I'm going to be late. Oh, that's okay. 
that's okay. Hey, you know, take your time. It's okay. I, I, you know, I bet, I bet something happened. No worries, you know, kind of thing. Or, hey, I forgot to pay the bill. Ah, oh, you know what? That happens. You know, I forget stuff too, and that, that's fine. No, no worries. It's not, aha, see, I told you. I told you. See, you, you forgot again. You know what? You always forget. You're just such a forgetter, right? I can't trust you with anything. I, I better want to be the one paying the bills nowadays because I, I, you know, do you see how the difference kind of, kind of idea? Like it just, it just, it's either I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw you in or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you away. And listen, I'm not saying you, you don't have difficult conversations. And I'm not saying you don't address unhealthy or destructive behavior, right? And I'm not saying you, you, you blindly trust somebody for the rest of their lives and, and, and that. I mean, there's, there's a point where, you know, they have proven themselves untrustworthy all the time. But in relationships where you care and you want to be in these relationships and when you want to keep going forward and, and there's enough to go off the trust on some level, you can either spiral upward or downward. And oftentimes it comes down to how we choose to fill in the blank. And it's like, I'm going to trust you until you've given me no other option to trust you. No other way. And you know, our motivation behind all of this is so simple. Our motivation is what Jesus said to us as far as the golden rule, right? Why, do we, why should we do this? Well, because he says, I want you to do to others as you would have them do to you. Because at the end of the day, isn't that what we would want in a relationship coming from the other person? when we're late, when we forget something, when we don't meet their expectations, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, it's like, don't you want them to believe the best about you? I know I do. And let me tell you why this is also so important, especially in our 21st century culture that we live in, and especially for our young people. Our young people today don't know how to do relationships well at all. They don't. And what they're seeing and and in, in the world is adults not knowing how to do relationships well either. And it's so easy for us to go negative. It's so easy for us to assume the worst. And one of the reasons why, again, why we do this is so it's so self, self-protective and it's like, I'm just going to do this. And it's not just I assume the worst, but I'm going to cancel you. Now that I have this narrative in my head, I'm just going to cancel you out. And so it's so easy for us to do in a culture where our young people need to see something different. They need to see what love does differently than the world, that I'm going to believe the best until I have no other option available. So with that in mind, here's what the Apostle Paul writes again in 1 Corinthians 13. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. It always protects, meaning I am looking to protect this relationship. I'm looking to protect you. I'm not looking to add another, you know, something in the negative column. I'm looking to protect this relationship. It always trusts, meaning I'm always going to try to give you the benefit of the doubt when I can, when it's all possible. I'm going to trust you. I want you to move in my direction. I'm not going to try to push you away. Always hopes. I'm hoping there's a good explanation. I'm hoping there's a good reason. I don't know it yet, but let's, let's talk about it. But I'm hoping in the meantime, there is a good reason, and I'm, as always perseveres, I'm not going to give up on you. As I know this is tough, like, especially when it comes to like, trust and should I continue to trust or not trust. But, but Paul, in a, in a very general I think, thing as far as love, right? That there's, there's this idea of, hey, as much as possible, let's extend this kind of gracious explanation to others. And at some point, it may, it may end up running out. I understand, like patience, right? Love is patient, but at some point, you're, patience. God runs out of patience at some point in Scripture, right? And so I, I understand there's this tension here, but, but just as much as possible, in the relationships, especially that matter most to us, are we, are we going to choose to try to move this thing upward or are we going to allow it to continue to go downward and see its demise? It's up really to us on how we fill in the blank. So let me just ask you a couple questions to end this. One is this, and this was convicting to me. Would you rather be right or would you rather be loving? And for some of us, this is a harder challenge than others because I love to be right. I love to be right. Have I told you how much I love to be right? And sometimes, many times, that's just not helpful. And, and you know how many people live in Wrightville? Population one, right? You could be right, I called it. I called it. See, I told you you were going to mess up again. I, I called it. Yep, you were right. But that's not very loving. And at the end of the day, 
Wouldn't we rather be more loving than always right? Second question. Who have you stopped extending a generous explanation to? Who in your life, who in your relationships, family, workplace, neighborhood, that you just have just allowed this thing to go downward so far, and you've just created this narrative in your mind that no matter what they do, they can't win. They can't get out of it because you just have painted them in such a negative picture that no matter what they do, well, you're always going to be right because they're never going to live up to your expectations. And that has caused fear and that's caused anxiety in that relationship where they don't want to even call you or text you or email you because they're afraid. They're just going to know. Like if I, I'm just never going to live up. I'm just going to disappoint, disappoint, disappoint. Who in your life have you stopped extending a generous explanation to? Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's up to you on how you fill in this blank. Believe the best, assume the worst. That is always up to you. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much. God, this was, this was always convicting every time I think about this. And it's so easy to get in the habit of assuming the worst, of going negative. But I pray, Lord, that that we would begin, for some of us who have a hard time with this, just begin loving people in a way that expresses the love that you have shown to us. To be generous and kind in our explanations. To extend grace time and time again. That even with past experiences and being trying to just protect ourselves, that that some relationships, man, we, we worth worth fighting for, and we just need to keep keep going back. I'm gonna I'm gonna choose to believe the best, even when you've hurt me in the past. And I know that's that's a tough balance of, of being wise, but I just pray that you give us the wisdom on this one. This is a tough passage, God, to to wrestle through. But I just pray that we would end up choosing not to always want to be right, but we choose to be loving. God, thank you for Jesus who moved in our direction, who gave us the space, who showed us the kindness, the grace that, that wants us to move towards his direction. God, thank you. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, don't miss part three next week. You will not, you will regret it if you, if you don't come, okay? So that's all I have. Have a great Sunday. I know I'm blanking out here. Fill in the blank here. Have a great Sunday. My wife went, what are you saying? I don't know. I'm done. See ya.